the serpent will eat dust. Why? All the other animals have been altered and changed. Why isn't the serpent? Because if there's no violence in his holy kingdom, that means no animal will eat another animal. Which means the serpent will eat nothing but dust. That is all it will eat. Dust, dirt, sand will be its food. Why? I'm going to read it to you. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Okay? What was it I just read? Oh, no, no, no. In a one word, what would you call that? God pronounced what? It actually says the word, didn't it? It's a curse. The serpent has been cursed all the days of its life. So in the, in the millennial kingdom, it can't change. Because if it changed, God would contradict himself. And God does not contradict himself. So unfortunately for the serpent, it, will, it does not have a choice in this. Now there's a secondary cause. What does the serpent represent? Which you about you basically hit on. Which, remove that first word. Sin. So the serpent represents sin. Is sin still in the world? It has to be. Why? You have fleshies. As long as you have fleshies, you have sin. Now, what causes sin? Or excuse me, let me rephrase that. What brings about the sin nature? And it's, 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 it's a loaded question, I know. It could be a thousand answers. But specifically what I'm looking for is the seed of man. The seed of man brings sin. And it goes back to Christ. Why? The prophecy of Christ was he'd be born of a virgin. Why? Because he had to be born of the seed of a woman. Well, the woman doesn't have a seed. The woman has the egg. The man provides the seed. So Christ had to be born of the seed of a woman, which technically does not exist. So the Holy Spirit came upon her and provided the seed. That she, of her own seed and egg, would conceive the Christ. Now, why did it have to be a virgin? Just so be part of a miracle? No. It was miraculous. It was a miracle. But that isn't why it happened like that. It happened like that because the woman does not carry sin within her. The only sin that she possesses is the sin from the seed from which she was created. It's the only reason she has it. But the man provides the seed. The sin is in the seed. Regardless of which gender it makes, it comes from the seed of the man. From the seed of the man because Eve did not sin. Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam sinned. So from that point on, Adam passes along the seed of sin. It comes from the man. The egg of a woman is perfect and without sin. Unfortunately, it's worthless without the sin seed of man. It's a catch-22, which is one reason women are more perfect than men, at least in that area. <laughs> when it comes to procreation, they got us beat hands down, hook, line, and sinker, because their half is perfect. Ours is tainted. So, I got a little off track there, but the serpent remains and remains with the curse because it's a reminder of the fall of man. It's a reminder of sin because sin is still in the world and the serpent can still be used as a living testimony to what happens, that there's a consequence to sin. It doesn't just go away by itself. Without the blood of Christ, there is no recompense for it. Thankfully, he gave us a way out. He gave us a way to cleanse us of that sin. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that it's just going to remain. It's going to stick because God's word says it had to. Now, theoretically, once it comes to the point of existence where there is no more sin, I'm assuming there will be no more serpent. There might be no more animals. But it doesn't say that I know of, that I've found yet. I'm still working on it. But at this point, 
The serpent remains. The curse is still in place because the curse is a reminder. And the curse cannot be lifted without God violating his own word. Now, the government. Y'all thought we were going to get away from government once God showed up, huh? Wrong. There will be a hierarchy. It will exist. Now, here's the cool part. We get to be a part of it. It's cool, right? All right, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, it reads, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. On the throne of David and all over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So we have, it's stating as point blank, that the government will rest on his shoulders. Which is, another way of saying it would be, he's responsible and he will oversee his government. And his peace will come forth from it. And it establishes that there will be a hierarchy. So we can move then on to who's that going to be. We'll get there in a minute. In Isaiah 11, chapter 4, or ch- 11, chapter 11, verse 4, it reads, But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted on the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. So, we've already established that there will still be sin. So, since there's still sin, there's still need for a judge. In this verse, with righteousness, he will judge. Christ is now your judge, jury, and executioner. Honestly, if you're like to sin... And you know who your judge, jury, executioner is? Why would you do it? It's one of those things we, if you are a man of God or a woman of God, it's beyond your comprehension because you know the truth. Something that applies to a lot of these debates I've been going through and listening to. I hear these atheists argue with Christians about this and that and these scientists saying God doesn't exist. You know why they don't believe God exists? You can't find God if you're not looking for God. Can't do it. If you're going to be blind and close your eyes, you you can't find Him. You have to seek after Him. A part of it's required on our behalf. But if you are established in your mind that that He doesn't exist, He's not real, well, it doesn't make you right. And you'll find out you're wrong one day, unfortunately, it might be too late. So what we've established from that verse is there will be perfect justice and perfect correction. What more could we ask for? It's what every Christian, every God-fearing person wants is a perfect justice system. And I'll go on more, a little more towards that on the end. But it does also show us that sin has to exist. Otherwise, this would not be needed. So, I had an idea just now. I wish I had done it if I had thought about it earlier. You guys know those like little criminal organization charts where they have a box to two boxes and to four boxes and to, you know, those, you know, as it works its way down to the ladder? <coughs> okay, at the very top, we have Christ, Christ the King. In Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it reads, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say. Now, here in the Greek, the word nations, this is not talking about the Jews. The nations is referring to the Gentile nations. And if you look at the actual original Greek word part of this verse, in an interlinear translation, it's talking about Gentiles there specifically. So we read that as many Gentiles will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law 
So right there we have, he is the establishment of the law. He will set it forth. This is right, this is wrong, and it will go out to all the nations of the world. Even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Okay? So he's going to be, he's not going to put forth the law, but he will make decisions regarding all the nations of the world. Now, how is he going to get that there? Say that question to the end. They will ha- then, then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. So what you have is literally a perfectness that Christ will exercise throughout the whole world to the point where weapons will not even be needed anymore. There will be no more war during his kingdom. Nothing will happen during his kingdom. Now, after his kingdom is a whole other story, or at the end of it will be a whole other story. So no more war, perfect instruction, perfect law. Then right below Christ on that board we have in our heads is the next person. Who can tell me who that next person is? Oh, come on. Who's number two? The Prince of God. The Prince of Jesus. Be David. King David. Which makes sense. I mean, as far as any man who's ever lived on the earth, aside from Christ himself, would be David. No man's ever had more power. Not more land, more territory, but I mean, God given anointing and power. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9, But they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Ezekiel 34, 23, and 24, Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. So you guys will never ever forget again. Christ has a prince. And he's the most popular man in the Bible. The human from whom the bloodline of Christ came from. So it makes sense. So David will be resurrected, sit in authority, and he will govern. Who's he going to govern? The whole world? Nope. Christ will control, will rule the whole world. Under him will be David. So, if David won't rule the whole world, it stands to reason he'll rule a very specific part of it. And have to be Israel. Because my people and nations is a distinction there between Jews or the Israelites and the Gentiles. So basically, so you have King David on the throne in the temple under God ruling over Israel now can David himself is it likely in your mind think of the hierarchy he's going to govern the entire country by himself could he yes but what would make that easier is Israel one country and is that all Israel is just one country no what is Israel a combination of 12 tribes so what makes more sense David ruling over 12 tribes or David ruling over 12 people, ruling over 12 tribes. So David will rule the 12 leaders of 12 tribes. How do we know that? Well, here's the next clip before we do that. Who is the leader of the 12 tribes? Can you take a guess at it? No. The number 12 is synonymous with them. Disciples, the 12 disciples, yeah. How do we know that? Now, my question, my next question before I read this verse is, how many times have you read this verse and that thought never clicked in your head? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, how many times have you read that and that thought never clicked in your head? The twelve disciples will govern the twelve tribes in the millennial kingdom. 
I've never, until I read it,